All right. Uh, I think I'll get started uh, and uh, tell you guys a bit about my work with engineering strains of yeast to produce various cannabinoids. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm from Montreal. Uh, this is my first DEF CON, and uh, uh, it's, yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, my background is primarily in biochemistry, um, but I am the CEO of, of Hyacinth, and I do a lot of the fundraising stuff. Um, and on the side, I also do some like biohacking and DIY bio sort of stuff. So I've been to Hope another, uh, I guess I've been to Hope a couple times, and so uh, I'm somewhat familiar with hacking things, but I'm not very good at any any hacking stuff. So um, hopefully today and tomorrow I'll, I'll learn something from you guys. Um, a little closer to the mic, yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, to get things started, I guess, I don't know if you guys were here for the rest of the day and saw the other talks, but maybe you got a bit of a primer about cannabis and how it grows and how to tell if it's sick or not, or what the chemistry looks like. Um, we had some fantastic talks earlier about that. Um, I'm going to shift the focus away from maybe cannabis plant stuff and talk more about specifically the cannabinoids, which are the name for the active ingredients in cannabis. So like THC is one cannabinoid, CBD is another cannabinoid, and there's about a hundred others. Um, and the basic question to start things off is like, you know, where do they come from? And, and also like how much do they cost? Um, of course, you know, most intuitive thing is to grow plants and to get THC and that's, that's pretty good. Um, and uh, as far as like, you know, costs go for growing plants, I mean, you guys, people who have done their own growing would know their own estimates, but I think uh, uh, if you had pure THC, maybe like $10 a gram kind of thing, if you really want to like, you know, get your costs down. Um, but anyways, plants are just one way of getting THC, and, and as we saw earlier, you can also synthesize THC using chemistry. Um, and that's kind of what you know you would see in the middle image there is like a big chemical plant that's producing all this THC. I think that plant in particular is for uh, some other pharmaceutical or antibiotic or something like that. Um, but I'm here to talk about a third way of doing this stuff, which is to engineer strains of yeast to produce uh, THC and other cannabinoids, uh, which has its own set of advantages um, uh, compared to chemistry and, and compared to growing plants. Um, so as a bit of an introduction to what this is all about, um, we're talking about biosynthesis here, which means that there are chemical reactions happening inside the plant cells that will take you know, sugar all the way to something called olivatolic acid, then to cannabidiolic acid, and eventually to uh, THC or uh, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid um, and, and CBD. Um, and these chemical reactions are driven by enzymes, which uh, are the molecular machinery um, of the cell. And, and I don't know how, what kind of backgrounds people have in like biochemistry and stuff like that. Um, but these enzymes, um, are, uh, are genes inside cannabis that you can cut and paste and move around if you wanted to. Um, and so our goal is to kind of take these genes from cannabis, and, like those segments of DNA that are responsible for producing THC, and put those into a strain of yeast. Um, and then that yeast we can grow using just sugar and water and really big steel tanks that go up to hundreds of thousands of liters and, and have a really big like industrial scale kind of system for producing uh, pure THC that's a lot more efficient than chemistry and, and growing plants. Um, what this looks like from a, a, I guess, overview standpoint is that, you know, you're when you're thinking about what a yeast is doing in its cells, it takes in sugar and it grows. That's, that's what a yeast does, and it produces CO2, um, and, uh, or it produces ethanol if you wanted to make a beer or something like that. Um, and our job as a, uh, uh, metabolic engineers and genetic engineers is to look at this pathway and add on things that are going to get us to making something like olivatolic acid and eventually to, uh, to THC. Um, so this involves a lot of like changing around the genome of yeast and tweaking certain things and uh, figuring out different ways to grow it so that it does optimize for production of THC. Um, and in the simplest you know way of thinking about this, you know we add three or four enzymes. You know they convert from sugar to uh, to THC in the end, and that's you know the easy like you know way to think about the problem. Um, but 
and then if you wanted to make something like CBD, then you remove the THC producing enzyme and you add a CBD producing enzyme and then you're making CBD and see THC. Uh, and this is one of the advantages of you know manipulating genetics so that you can switch things on, switch things off, you can control this stuff like a program. Um, the challenge comes in uh, as things get more complicated when you're talking about like 100 different cannabinoids and, and all these other metabolites that get made alongside of it um, where it's not you know as easy as adding just three or four genes to a yeast and then you get THC out. You're gonna be playing around with maybe hundreds of different genes and for us, you know, we've gone through uh, uh, hundreds if not thousands of combinations of different genes to optimize and to improve always on um, our yields and to try and get to different, uh, producing different cannabinoids. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of, you know, how we think about uh, this stuff. Um, and just to clarify one thing, I guess, we saw a bit of this earlier too. Uh, we're not thinking about synthetic cannabinoids at all. Like we're just interested in the ones that the plants make. Um, you could possibly engineer yeasts to produce some of these synthetic cannabinoids, but um, there's not as much of like an interest in these things uh, right now. So I don't usually use the word synthetic when I talk about what we do because people get sometimes confused about synthetic cannabinoids versus ones from plants and uh, we're making the ones from plants, but we're not growing plants and anyways. Um, yeah. All right, so after we've made cannabinoids and the question is, okay, where do we go? Um, and, and this comes to you know, talking about why we're doing this whole thing. Um, as, uh, as we would have seen earlier as well, and probably you guys know, like cannabinoids go into your brain, they react with your cannabinoid receptors, and then you get you know, the various effects, like you know, feeling high or having an appetite or whatever else, and all kinds of different things. Or as Mark Lewis said this morning, uh, maybe you know, tweaking your entire personality apparently is part of this, this system. Um, but uh, it's a uh, yeah, super interesting system to manipulate, and there's all these different cannabinoids that are going to affect it. Um, and that's ultimately you know, what we're uh, working towards. Um, and because cannabinoids do this, uh, that means that we can use them to treat various diseases, um, whether that's for epilepsy or for uh, mental health disorders like depression or anxiety. Um, even glioblastoma has like these, you know, late stage brain cancers has seen a lot of interesting results from uh, using THC along with other cancer treatments. Um, and then nausea, appetite, uh, appetite loss during cancer therapy is another. Um, that one is what Marinol that exists on the market right now is prescribed for. And there's also another product called Sativex that's uh, cannabis extract that's also a prescription drug. Um, so a lot of uh, newer cannabinoid stuff kind of points in that direction. So I guess out of these two, out of these four pictures, maybe the biggest ones are epilepsy, which is fairly new, and then nausea, appetite, and stuff is kind of the classical, you know, thing that people will try to use cannabinoids for. Um, and there's the famous story of Charlotte's Web and this whole thing where CBD is now like being used for treating epilepsy. Um, and there's a really interesting timeline where this stuff kind of came out in 2013 and then 2014, like a, the pharmaceutical company, GW Pharmaceuticals, started their first trials of CBD with epilepsy. And now it's, uh, as of a uh, few months ago, um, on its way to the market um, and approved by the FDA. Um, and uh, yeah, so when it comes to thinking about like why we're doing this, uh, we're really interested in looking at um, different ways of producing THC and CBD and not just thinking exclusively about growing plants as like this has to be the be all end all solution because it does take a lot of energy and, uh, and time to grow plants. Uh, and if I think in, in terms of numbers, it's like, yeah, three months to grow a plant. And if you really want to get high levels of THC, then you have to grow it indoors in a very controlled environment. Uh, and how about this like lighting energy and stuff like that? So it's really not that you know, environmentally friendly uh, or economical to, to grow THC using that method. Um, and then with chemistry, you're working with petroleum-based compounds. You're having multiple different reactors and all these interesting like, temperature controls and, uh, and reagents that have to go into that process. And that also becomes quite complicated and can take you know, weeks as well to do. Um, but with yeast, it's more like you, know, you add sugar, you add water, you add the yeast, you wait a week, the yeast grows up, then you do an extraction and get your THC out um, or CBD or whichever one that you're interested in. Uh, and that's the process that we're you know, aiming for. Um, 
And there's a few different advantages to this, um, but as far as you know, the impact that this is going to have on the industry is that we're finally going to be able to have a reliable supply chain for uh, CBD that's coming from a source that is industrially scalable. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, now my thoughts are like a little bit all over the place, but we'll bring it back. Um, I'll keep going, and then I'll bring it back. And then you guys can ask questions, and then I'll, uh, everything will be OK. Um, so it, yeah, it is quite hard to grow, uh, grow cannabis plants. Um, and uh, I haven't tried growing them myself. Uh, and I mean, it, maybe it is easy, kind of easy to do it in your closet if with the right amount of investment. Uh, but once you start scaling things into like agricultural level, and you're starting to build out you know, acres of greenhouses that get you know, entirely contaminated with powdery mildew, and then you lose like, millions of dollars of crops at the same time, um, instead of like you know a few leaves in your plant in your closet, um, then you're getting into problems. So uh, there was a few cases in Canada where some of these big marijuana companies that were growing these huge amounts of product uh, were using uh, pesticides that they weren't allowed to use because there's only a few pesticides that you're allowed to use because uh, uh, that's the way that Health Canada restricts things, um, and for good good reason because you're you're lighting this product on fire, you're inhaling it, and if you're inhaling pesticides, then that's different from when you're eating pesticides, and so there's, there's a really you know, restrictive thing there. Um, and so there's a few companies that got caught using these pesticides, and that was uh, causing some health problems in Canada. And I think this is still, uh, in the US, um, I'm not sure where things are at as far as pesticide use exactly, but um, I'm glad that in Canada this was discovered and this was enforced, and uh, that might not necessarily be true for all the different U.S. states. And now with California's legalization coming up, there's expected to be some kind of bottleneck in cannabis testing labs where there just aren't enough labs to test all the cannabis that's going to go on the, to the market. So how are you supposed to know if your cannabis does or does not have these pesticides in it? Um, but anyways, all of these problems are associated with growing cannabis plants and not with yeast, of course, because when you grow yeast, it's just in these very controlled environments, uh, and you're focusing just on extracting your THC and not having, you don't have to add any pesticides or antibiotics or anything like that. Um, the other key advantage is, is in diversity of products. So, uh, like was mentioned earlier, uh, we, I see these things kind of like Lego blocks where, you know, there's going to be a hundred different cannabinoids, there's going to be a whole bunch of terpenes, and they're all these different, like, molecular uh, compositions that you could build and put together to create these optimal experiences for uh, when you use a cannabinoid or a cannabis product. Um, and to kind of dismiss the idea of like getting down to that finer grain stuff and discovering what all these things do um, is uh, like we have to know these things. And it's super interesting to know, you know, which perfect combination will be the best treatment for epilepsy or which uh, perfect combination will be the best treatment for like a Friday night you know, out, night out or something like that. Um, and, uh, and this is also part of the reason why, you know, yeast is so interesting is because you can manipulate the genetics, you can clone new things, you can build new cannabinoids, um, or, or very quickly, you know, scale up new kinds of products uh, using this technology. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the question of scale is the other one. Uh, and this is maybe the biggest kind of clear thing that is becoming more and more defined as we go along with the development of the bigger and bigger grow-ups um, is uh, if you think about the scale that is needed to treat something like epilepsy, like there's 50 million people in the world who have epilepsy and uh, now there's like between CBD and CBDV um, some new drugs being developed for treating epilepsy. Um, and if you if you add that up to like the you know how much the dosage is and what this is going to take, then you're getting into the range of like you know 1,500 tons of of pure CBD or CBDV, like the pure cannabinoid product. Um, and I think if you compare that against like a cannabis growth operation and maybe the total amount of cannabis in the world right now, it's still uh, maybe a hundred or a thousand times away from getting close to that those kinds of numbers. Um, and if you're willing to bet some money on like, you know, what's going to be the scalable best way to grow cannabis, uh, it's going to cost you maybe a hundred million dollars to get to 16 tons per year of product. And if you pay uh, more like $50 million of, of uh, investment, then you might build a facility that grows yeast and you can do more like 750 tons per year. Um, and so, you know, this is the reason why yeast is so interesting because it has this established industrial scalable uh, uh, model of manufacturing. 
Um, and this is my last slide, and then I'm excited to go to questions. Uh, in Canada, I'm from Canada, so you can ask me about the Canadian law system and what's going on there, because I, I know quite a bit about that. Um, but uh, it's actually funny just to share a bit of perspective where uh, Canada has this, like, you know, very well-defined objective of, like, you know, cannabis being illegal is a health risk because it exists as a black market and so on and so forth, and there's access to youth that they wanna, really want to control. Um, and so uh, they're, they're motivated in this way to create legalization and to create a framework for ac getting access to cannabis uh, legally. Um, and so, you know, instead of us dealing with the uh, DEA, like the Drug Enforcement Agency or the, the FBI or whoever else that, you know, manages it, where it's a kind of a narcotics control board that's managed by the police, we deal with Health Canada, where it's like a public health agency that is uh, oriented towards improving the health of Canadians. And they see this as like the priority. Um, so uh, you're welcome to ask me more questions about that. Um, and maybe you can write into your own uh, governments about you know this perspective because I think it's it's kind of one of these uh, uh, ruling arguments uh, for towards cannabis legalization. And something's on fire. All right. Um, Yes, carbon footprints. Yeah, yeah. I guess we'll sit tight, or we can we can get up and go outside, or something like that. I don't know. What are we supposed to do? Is it going to be? Is this going to be like a minute? Longer? Okay. We can talk while she's talking between alarms. We'll do it very quickly. I do. Yes. All right, yay. Uh, all right, uh, questions then. Uh, yes, and back. How'd you actually, you said you engineered the yeast to make THC. How'd you go about doing that? Um, so, like I said earlier, the basic concept is to look at the genes in cannabis and take, take those, uh, and I can speak more specifically, I guess. Um, the cannabis genome is sequenced, it's online somewhere, along with the genomes of various other organisms, along with yeast, of course. And so you can look at the genomes and pull the segments of DNA out, uh, email those to a DNA synthesis company, and they'll make it for you and send it to you in the mail. Um, and so, you know, we've never actually touched any kind of plant material, we just use the digital DNA information and then just have it ordered online for us. Um, and that's the, probably the fastest and easiest way to do this kind of stuff. Um, and then there's like five or six different techniques, including like CRISPR-Cas9 stuff that you can use to engineer yeast. Um, it really depends on you know what your approach is and what gene you're targeting. Um, so uh, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat and tears and blood and everything that goes into engineering the yeast. Uh, but uh, 
it'll take more time than it would take to you know grow a plant but to you know uh, if you wanted to breed a plant that would have high amounts of THCV or something like that, then you're probably better off using a yeast than and engineering that instead of trying to breed a plant to do that kind of thing. Yes. Okay, you just said something that might be a little separate from the overall topic. Yes. Um, you receive sequences, or you find sequences of DNA online, and then you send them to a lab, and then you receive plant material in return. No plant material. No plant material. What is it that you are receiving? Because there are a lot of people who are very concerned about people using online genetic material about cannabis to 3D print plants. And it's like, there's like a whole thing. And so as somebody who's invested in this level of um, biochemical engineering, um, what do you know about that? Um, let's see. Uh, if I go to, oh, I'm not, I'm not online, Never mind. Okay. All right, we won't do a live demo, but anyways. Uh, you can go to idtdna.com or look up just DNA synthesis companies and you can write in DNA sequences and they'll, they'll make them for you and it'll cost like 10 cents per letter that you order. Um, and then they send you the actual DNA sequence which will look like a clear powder or like a liquid or whatever. And then that's what you work with. And that's, you know, the DNA is inside that liquid and that's all you're handling. So there's no actual plant material being moved around um, or anything like that. Uh, that's that's kind of how it how it goes. Okay. How far away are you, do you think from being able to take, for example, a sequence of DNA for say a cannabis, you know, an example of cannabis, and then like use that to create a plant material directly from it? Um, so if you were if you were starting with synthesized DNA, mm -hmm. then you would need to have also like a plant material to add it into. Got it. Uh, so you're not like growing from scratch, of course. Um, okay. And and this is where like what Mark was saying earlier about how you need to have isolated versions of plant cells that can be grown into plants and then you can cultivate, you know, modified strains, like all this technology that's involved. Um, that's part of what you would need to take synthesized DNA and make modified plants. Um, so you wouldn't be able to order a plant online by just typing the DNA right. sequence of the plant and then, yes, it's not it's yet, one day. One maybe, day. maybe, maybe like, like in, in, maybe in 10 years, maybe like 100 years, I don't know, I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I saw Annie in the back first. Um, has there been any research as to the effectiveness of plant-derived cannabinoids versus bioengineered cannabinoids? Like, what are the um, Not specifically. And uh, that is one of the things that we'll be testing, like, as soon as we are uh, make the stuff and are authorized to do all the testing and whatever else needs to happen for that. Um, but basically, when we're when we're looking at and when we're thinking about this, uh, we're talking about the chemical composition and what's going to work the best. And so, when if you took THC that's been isolated into 100% pure from the plant, 100% pure from like chemical synthesis, and maybe 100% pure from biosynthesis, and compare those side by side, you should have exactly the same results no matter what. Um, and then the usually the finer detail of like how effective a cannabis thing is versus aesthetic thing is, is when you're talking about these compositions of cannabis oils where, yeah, there's more stuff in cannabis oil and so you get different kinds of effects compared to just like a purified form of THC. Um, and that'll be something that we consider when we go into our own testing is like, we're not just wanting to make purified THC because that's kind of been done and uh, doesn't work that well compared to cannabis in many cases. Uh, I saw this uh, in, yeah, over there in the back, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, about 12 months kind of thing. Yeah, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and right behind you. Uh, so asking for a friend, where does one uh, purchase this piece? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not for sale yet. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe on our website eventually, uh, heisenbio.com. You can go there and try it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, highestinthbio.com. That's our website. I have business cards and stickers and stuff. You guys can come up to the front and grab some, too. Uh, who had, did I have next? Was it you next, I think? You've got your hand. You still have your hand up, so let's go with you. Uh, can you use this yeast theoretically in baking? Uh, theoretically, yes, and, and practically, probably yes as well. Um, and, and this has been done uh, or explored a bit with the people who are trying to engineer yeast to make opioid stuff. Like they took it and tried to brew a beer with it. And then the, I think their analysis was like, look, it doesn't make opioids, which is like, 
you know, it, it wouldn't because uh, the conditions are different because there's not very much yeast in there. Um, the, so you might be able to bake a bread with it. It might not have any THC in it, and that's just like the way it'll go. And it might smell like flowers or something like that because that's... Uh, All right, thanks. Um, in the back. All right. Yes, um, and there's some terpenes that uh, could possibly be good biosynthesis targets, like along with the cannabinoids. Um, but also some of these terpenes, I think you can get from other sources like kind of cheaply. And so, uh, or even like take a purified form of CBD that we make and mix that in with like a hemp oil. And then you have your, your full spectrum thing that way. Uh, there's a few different ideas that are, you know, we've got in mind for when we get to that stage. Yeah. So your main focus right now is CBD and that's mostly to, to get this to market and then eventually switch over to two different strains. Yeah, uh, it's a bunch of things in parallel kind of thing. So CBD, we've done maybe the most to work around, but also uh, like this kind of science does well when you try to do THC as well at the same time or THCV. And so we've got like a whole bunch of tracks that are running through in like high throughput kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I see somebody way in the back. Um, so when you're looking at like the yeast soup in like a liter of yeast soup, you would get like one gram of product kind of thing. Um, and, uh, that's like our, that's our at least next target. We're not, we're not there yet, but like, you know, that's sort of what we're aiming for. Um, and that's pretty good for a, uh, uh, a process. Um, Yeah. Yeah, insulin is is a yeah different yeah it, it's hard to compare I guess because every every product is a bit different and it's in uh, uh, insulin is like a protein so you need less of it and also it's uh, produced in much lower amounts uh, but I guess the comparison that I can draw is when people were trying to do biofuels using yeast where you know then they were getting like pretty a lot higher yields or they needed to get a lot higher yields in order to make it commercializable. Um, and then you're talking about like you know tens or hundreds of grams of product per liter of yeast, um, or or even more than that maybe. Uh, is, yeah. Um, so that's our kind of our goal. Yes. Are you actually extracting it? Um, so solvent extraction, uh, basically, and there's a bunch of other techniques. Like we could try supercritical CO2 stuff as well and do the same thing as we is done with plants. Um, and I'm going, I don't know if I'm going over time, but I guess Rex, are you up next? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. All right. Rex will tell me when he's ready to present. I'm ready to present. Okay, cool. So uh, this will be maybe one more question after this while Rex gets set up. Um, and, uh, and your question was extraction. Yeah, various methods. Uh, and there's, there's ones that are established pretty well for yeast, uh, like doing like column separation or, or solvent extraction stuff. It depends a bit on the product and depends if we're going for THC or if we're going for CBD and depends on like other things. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, Rex, yes? All right, cool. I'm excited for Rex's talk too, so stick around, yeah.